Okay, right, without any further delay, let's move to the ocean renewable energies. Um, we have Andrew Wand here from the Harriet Watt University, who I'm hoping is going to present a really very interesting presentation that I've seen already, I think. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you, John. Thanks, everyone. Um, keeping you from lunch, so I'll try to keep as interesting as possible and, uh, and try not to run over. Uh, I'm visiting from possible, I might possibly be winning in the furthest latitude. Maybe Norway might be questionable, but I'm from about 60 degrees north, uh, traveling from Orkney. <clears throat> and I'm speaking about work we're doing in the marine, oh, excuse me, offshore renewable energy sector. <clears throat> when I say offshore renewable energy, this refers to uh, the dominant is offshore wind right now, but approaching commercial um, level is tidal energy uh, devices, and there's also testing going on in wave energy devices. Uh, I'm based at Harry Watt University, which is in which is in Edinburgh mainly, but there's there's a wee campus up in Orkney, which is where I stay. So we're off the very far north of uh, Scotland. Uh, I'd like to say that I'm part of a, of a larger team, and I'd like to acknowledge my various colleagues who have contributed to some of the research that I'll be presenting today. Uh, where are we? Uh, as, as I just mentioned, we are located just off the very far north end of Scotland. Uh, it's an area of extreme high waves. The fetch, if you look west, uh, is about 3,000 kilometers until you reach Canada, and there are also very, very, very strong tidal conditions uh, in this area. So for this reason, the UK government, as part of its objectives to decarbonize energy, uh, sorry, electricity generation, has uh, invested money into, uh, into researching wave and tidal devices. Uh, so various areas within this uh, archipelago have been identified as areas for testing of and development of these devices. So specifically, the Penland Firth, the body of water that separates Orkney from uh, mainland Britain, uh, has experiences tides regularly of up to six meters per second, so about 12 knots, so some very, very, very impressive tides. And as this uh, graphic here illustrates, uh, on, the, on the right, uh, there is commercialization level, industrial scale level uh, is beginning of tidal turbines. <clears throat> and as you already know, of course, offshore energy uh, includes um, wave, uh, excuse, wave wind deployments, which are uh, very much further developed. So, biofouling. What is the problem? This has been spoken about repeatedly, so I don't need to go into any in great detail. But, <clears throat> excuse me, from the uh, from the uh, from the shipping standpoint, much of the same issues are relevant to the offshore renewable energy uh, sector. So, for example, increased roughness, increased weight. Um, acceleration of corrosion, uh, and that is very costly, the, uh, the experience of removing fouling. Are there unique issues? Is it a new problem for marine and offshore renewable energy technologies? The answer is yes, there are some unique issues. So just going through this quickly, uh, we are using novel components and materials are being used in the marine environment which haven't previously been tested properly. The coatings necessary to protect them are not necessarily have been fully uh, vetted. Uh, devices have been placed in very poorly understood habitats. I'm thinking here about tidal, extreme tidal current flows, are areas where humans typically avoid. We don't put structures in high tidal flow environments. Shipping often avoids these areas as well. Uh, and also, and this was alluded to, um, I think, in the naval uh, section, uh, the sensors which are used uh, to detecting resource, et cetera, uh, can be compromised by fouling. So there are some significant issues to that. But from a, a biofouling and a non-invasive, excuse me, and an invasive species standpoint, uh, what is particularly of concern, and this very much relates to many discussions that have gone on, is that the potential of stepping stones being formed by placing additional devices within the seabed. This graphic maybe is not very, very clear, but we see here the, the oil and gas uh, deployments within the North Sea obviously are very, very extensive, although these are becoming decommissioned, which I'll come back to later. And also uh, wind, uh, this is missing some recent ones here in Scotland, but the wind uh, offshore energy uh, industry is also placing lots of devices in this uh, sector as well. So 
potential for the spread of invasive species owing to this extra artificial structures being placed in the sea. So our main objectives are as follows. Uh, we're trying to gather data on biofouling in these poorly understood habitats that have not been, again, rigorously investigated, and also to try to develop a monitoring system specific for this industry, which can, again, give us this uh, unique information that we require. <clears throat> Testing of materials and anti-fouling coatings, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Uh, specific for this industry, uh, and then to provide guidance on fouling. Apologies for the frog in my throat. Um, <clears throat> so what kind of guidance are we talking about? <clears throat> to the industry, we want to provide uh, evidence to, uh, uh, to allow them to lower their levelized cost of uh, electricity, ideally, ideally intentionally to make them um, more competitive. <clears throat> also, we want to improve biofouling management for this sector, so specific issues associated with this sector. And of particular relevance to the Globe Fouling Project, um, we would like to improve and give advice and guidance uh, to do with biosecurity. We do a variety of surveys, typical surveys doing rapid assessment surveys on any opportunity we get. Anytime a device comes up or infrastructure comes up, we try to do testing and, uh, do, and do survey work of this. So we're compiling, compiling a database of the main structures, the different types of materials, be it concrete, be it steel, be it uh, HDPE, et cetera, and identify the main organisms which are a problem in this particular habitat that we're looking at. <clears throat> During analysis of these assemblages, what we do find is very clear clustering. This is showing harbor and marina areas, uh, more sheltered areas, uh, this cluster clearly is showing, uh, is showing high wave environment uh, assemblages, biological assemblages. Uh, and this cluster here of this MDS plot is showing uh, high tidal environments. So again, this is, the, the take on point of this is just that there are specific assemblages that you find based upon hydrodynamic conditions. It's not terribly rocket science or new novel necessarily, but it's, it's clearly you know, showing evidence to support this uh, this. Uh, this idea. One of the main uh, areas that we're, where we collect, that we're having collecting survey data are from wave rider buoys. So I wanted to show this illustration because it's very easy, fairly easy to collect uh, biofouling data from the surface of a buoy, etc. Cetera, et cetera. It's also quite easy to uh, collect data from uh, a mooring system. But you also find, of course, that there is a whole area in between that we sometimes have limited data on. And this, of course, is actually the area where, if you imagine a tidal turbine turning in the middle of the water channel, that's going to be the area where it's actually operating. And that's the area where we have little information. <clears throat> so using wave rider voice has allowed us to get some inf further information on different depths associated with fouling. But it's also inspired us to develop a novel monitoring and testing system. <clears throat> so what we're trying to do is to develop a system which will allow us to monitor uh, organisms at any given depth in the water column and to be deployed in extreme high wave and, and, and uh, tidal energy environments to allow us to test different materials and to allow us to test different coatings uh, and to be easily deployed. Uh, we've designed it to be physically robust to survive these extreme conditions and also statistically robust so that we can actually do uh, quantitative testing of, uh, of materials and, uh, and coatings. <clears throat> so, inspired by the Wave Rider buoy, we have the following system here, what we'll call the, the BioFree frame, and this has been deployed in Orkney waters at four different locations uh, that are all used by the industry that have various levels of wave and tidal, uh, tidal environment conditions, excuse me. Uh, we've developed a partnership with non-disclosure agreements with uh, around the globe. So we have various partners, which include the U.S., Japan, Chile, and France. There's a bit of an absence here in the uh, Indian Ocean, Australasia. So if anyone's interested in talking to us, we're very happy to, to discuss it further. <clears throat> so currently, these devices have been deployed uh, at various locations throughout the world. And so let's talk a little bit about some data. Uh, these are results from Orkney. Um, the take-home point of these is that 
at each location in a very close geographical region, but different hydrodynamic conditions, we get different fouling organisms. They're the typical ones I think the last two speakers ago was discussing. Tim was talking about uh, hydroids. Also, oh, Lauren was talking about hydroids, excuse me. Um, so hydroids are a major uh, pioneer fouling organism and, and other, other uh, common ones we associate. So we are collecting data on this, um, and the, 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 we kind of trying to talk about this in great detail, but the key, the key point here is just that in a, in a geographically similar area, uh, we're getting very, very different species are being located based upon what the hydrodynamic conditions are at this particular location, whether or not they are high wave, high tidal environments, et cetera. So I'll just go through a few more sort of uh, some of the results of our work. Uh, comparisons between coated versus uncoated. Uh, not surprisingly, the coated uh, have less fouling on them. Um, this is a comparison between different test sites, the four test sites in Orkney. I should point out, sorry, that while the, while the um, panels, the frames, excuse me, have been, have been sent across and deployed at those various countries throughout the world, they haven't yet been deployed in all of those countries. And the results uh, from Japan and the USA in particular haven't yet been uh, crunched. So I'm only presenting information from the, the Scottish, the Orkney results here. Uh, but again, this just shows that the, uh, the type of fouling, the amount of fouling you get is different at different locations. And a particular note is that at this site here called the Fall of Warness, there is a very, very uh, dramatic difference between the, uh, these two materials. And this is the site of the highest uh, tidal flow. We'll sort of come back to that in a second. Uh, this slide, it quite simply says that uh, things grow over time. So what we're doing with the panels is that they're being deployed for long term. Every three months, they are brought back on deck again. There is a uh, imagery is taken of all the panels. There is a changeover of some of the frames, some of the panels. So new ones are put in, old ones are taken out for close examination. And that is allowing us to do seasonality testing to see how the succession of fouling changes, if you follow what I'm saying. So what happens in September, for example, may be very, very, very different in March. And that's a key aspect we're trying to get to is to do with the timing of when you do a deployment of a device. So timing and scheduling of, of uh, cleaning may be very, very critical. A couple more slides just to illustrate this. Um, so yeah, basically this is showing the same frame over, over a period of time. And you see obviously the changes that are occurring uh, in this case, large amounts of sea squirts growing and proliferating. So our main uh, findings uh, at this point <clears throat> are as follows. Um, we've proven that this particular system that we've developed, the, the biofree system, works. It is, uh, it's easily deployable, it's easily retrievable, and it's, it's getting good results, providing good results. <clears throat> we found, and again, none of these are necessarily shocking revelations, but in the ore sector, offshore renewable energy sector, that the fouling organisms are, are highly specific to location, that they are, they depend upon water depth, unsurprisingly, and substrate type, but uh, especially the hydrodynamics uh, of, the, of the particular location is a very, very uh, important factor, uh, and orientation to flow may be important as well, or is important as well. The anti-fouling coatings are, have proven to be most, um, most effective in high tidal flow habitats, but on the same token, uh, that's, that's both a good thing, of course, from, from that standpoint, but it also suggests also in, in a high flow, you might get a greater dissolution of, of, of solutions, and you also might get abrasion as well. So this may be a bit of a double-edged sword as far as the effectiveness of anti fouling coatings in high current flow environments. <clears throat> um, yeah, and so let me move on and say that uh, we found certainly evidence that um, you can get extreme proliferation of fouling at certain timings of the year. So this is, a, this is something that was spoken about in the earlier talks today on aquaculture and, and some of the early talks. Timing, I think, is a very, very big issue. If you understand when fouling occurs, that can help motivate and help inform the um, maintenance schedule and operations. So this, I think, this I think is, is very relevant for all sectors in the, uh, in the marine industry, including shipping industry. Uh, if you know the periods of time when the worst fouling organisms are most of an issue when they're settling, then you might be able to inform your scheduling to be most effective at, uh, at, a, at, a, at removing and uh, preventing the, the uh, consequences. <clears throat> so with this, uh, this little um, traffic-like system here, 
is identifying the major fouling organisms associated with marine renewables uh, in, in Scottish waters. And again, it's just giving some idea of when to know the best times to potentially uh, try to mitigate these issues. One of the big things we've been speaking about and in glow fouling is the uh, topic of non-native species. Uh, so I just want to say, and this is a bit of good news, I guess, is that uh, while there are seven non-native species that we have identified in our surveys, they've all been identified in harbor and, and marina environments, which of course is quite, you, it's quite common that there are larger numbers of non-native species, typically in more sheltered waters where you're getting high traffic of uh, recreational vehicles and other shipping coming in. But we have found no non-native species are found at the high energy sites. So that's, that's a, a good, uh, I guess, hopefully that, that remains the case. And it might be, of course, because there are hydrographic barriers that are being created by these extreme energy uh, locations. Uh, I just want to just wrap up with a couple of brief uh, other projects that we're working on. We're looking at uh, decommissioning of structures as well, not only marine and offshore, renew sorry, offshore renewable energy uh, uh, decommissionings, but also oil and gas. But firstly, this is a, a project we're doing called FODTEC, uh, which we're working on with Blackfish Engineering and Brunel University, where we're doing a, a very detailed examination of all the fouling and corrosion that has occurred on these marine devices. And what we're planning on doing with this is expanding it further into studies looking at the connectivity of hard substrates found in the North Sea. So this goes back to an earlier point mentioning and that other people have mentioned about the stepping stone phenomena. With all of these devices and structures that have been placed throughout the North Sea, uh, are they creating a network that allows invasive species to spread from one area to another? And the North Sea uh, uh, industry in particular in the UK uh, which was big in the 1970s and the deployments in the 70s and 80s is now entering a decommissioning phase, not only because of its own, its own aging of it, but also because of our shift towards decarbonization. So what role does an oil and gas structure have or an offshore wind structure have, as Jeff was just mentioning, they have some, they are, there are some benefits. They produce artificial reef habitats. Uh, there were, I think on the very first day, someone was discussing what is epifaunal species versus a biofouling species. Well, it is kind of in the eye of the beholder. In the North Sea and in, and in the cold waters of the North Atlantic, there is a, a cold water coral called Lophelia, which is a, a priority species, and we try to encourage Lophelia to grow, and it loves oil and gas uh, installations. So when it comes down to decommissioning of oil and gas, do we want to decommission all of them? Do we want to derogate some of them, derogate some of them, and uh, make them exempt from, uh, from decommissioning? So what we're trying to work on is, is through larval dispersal models, trying to inform them with this monitoring, monitoring data that we're collecting, trying to inform them with the latest DNA analysis that's coming in. We would like to be able to understand better the, the connectivity of artificial structures and how we might be able to, I guess, engineer solutions that have the most, the greatest benefit uh, with the least uh, risk for the spread of non-native species. So I'd just like to end with a couple of final acknowledgements saying that if you have any interest in further what I've been speaking about, we have some, some papers on the topics. Uh, there was a webinar which we uh, organized uh, about six months ago. Uh, so please speak to me if you have any other further questions. I'll be happy to discuss further. And I would just like to end with some acknowledgements of the various uh, uh, organizations I work with, and special thanks to Glow Fowling, to John and Violetta and Lillian for the invitation to speak with you today. So thank you very much. <laughs>